I'm Sithrith. I'm Draculetta. I'm Mathelros. And you're listening to Radio Free Tyria, the Guild Wars 2 podcast for the casual crowd. This week we got a blog post, and it is about what is left for 2015 for Guild Wars 2. You know, obviously Heart of Thorns is released, so it's kind of like, oh, what's going to happen the rest of this year? Not a whole lot of time left. A little over, or a little under two months, rather. So they released, Colin Johansson released this blog post called The Road Ahead for 2015. And so he kind of goes into a little bit of detail, not a whole lot, um, about what we are going to be seeing the rest of this year. So first of all... Not surprisingly, there's going to be some more bug fixing and polish and balance and performance updates, because we've been getting those every couple of days since the expansion launched. So, yeah, again, not super surprising. Um, additionally, they are going to be releasing the first wing of the raid, and during that update, they're also going to be releasing the enhanced squad UI that did not come out with Heart of Thorns, because they still needed to tweak it a bit. And they are also going to be releasing the three new legendaries that people have been looking forward to, Astralaria, Hope, and Nevermore, and that is the Axe, the Pistol, and the Staff, respectively. So people are very excited about that. Um, people have been grinding away at their legendary mastery thing uh, in preparation. So that's a thing you might want to look into if you are interested in making one of these new legendaries. Uh, on top of that... Um, they're doing some more Pro League stuff, um, getting ready for the PvP League season. The PvP League season st- first season starts December 1st, which is really cool and exciting. I'm kind of sad because I'm going to miss the first two weeks of the season because I'm going to be on vacation and not near my gaming computer. So I'm going to miss the first two, se- two weeks, but it is a seven-week season, so that's pretty exciting. I'm actually really excited about that, and... This month in November, leading up to that, they're going to be doing Pro League qualifiers. So if you think you are pro enough to be in a Pro League for PvP in Guild Wars 2, you can sign up and try and qualify and and do that. And best of luck to you. They've already, obviously, you know, qualified some teams like the Abjured and Orange Logo and stuff like that because, you know, obviously they win World Cup, like the World Cup tournament all the time. So, of course, they're qualified. Um, on top of that, um, so, you know, PvP League's December 1st, there's also going to be the Guild Challenger League thing, and also they announced that on December 15th they're going to be doing the Winter's Day Festival, so that's still going to happen. They did say that there is going to be new stuff, um, no specifics, of course, on what, they just said new rewards, outfits, skins, snowball fights, festive decorations for your guild halls, ho-ho-trons, and more await you as we celebrate the holiday season. So that's a thing. Uh, they also said that they're still working on uh, combat visibility. I know a lot of people, especially as Guild Wars 2 kind of tries to ramp itself up as an e- like, uh, esports on the level of League of Legends and Dota 2 and all that, um, combat visibility and spectating is kind of an issue because while it's really cool in-game when you do all your skill effects, it's sometimes confusing to see what's going on, especially like in a PvP setting where... All of your team are using big, huge effects, and all the enemy team are using big, huge effects that can kind of make things a bit muddy and hard to understand what's going on. So that's something they're continuing to work on. Um, And then, of course, they slightly touch on what's coming in 2016, which is um, we'll be back with another State of the Game update in 2016 after the holiday break. Uh, walk you through our plans for the early part of next year, including details about what you can expect from the regular live cadence for Guild Wars 2 in 2016. So that's not actually a whole lot of information about what we're going to see in 2016. Um, Hopefully more, like, living story kind of updates, I'm assuming, is what we're going to see. Imagine more of the raid stuff, too, at some point. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be releasing wings of the raid at regular intervals. Um, so that's uh, that's something to keep an eye on, and of course I'm sure we'll get tons and tons of random gem store outfits all the time, 
because that that happens. So that's pretty exciting. One one thing that I did find really exciting that they specifically said in the um, balance part was that um, kind of tying into the PvP leagues, they had said they're every before every season they're going to be doing balance updates and kind of rehashing that stuff. And I quote from the blog post, it says, we'll also be releasing limited balance updates to fix really key game-breaking issues. Once every quarter, we'll release a new major balance update to shake up the meta for the next quarter. So that's good. It sounds promising because, as you know, we're not super keen on the meta being super, you know, stable and being always the same. So if if things change frequently, I'm totally okay with that. I would like to see that happen. If the main core of the meta changes, I mean, if, like, they change everything except the fact that Berserker is there 99% of the time, it's not really going to mean much. Right. That is definitely true. I mean, yeah. I know we talked last episode about how we were upset about them removing the Minstrel Amulet from PvP because that kind of reinforces the meta rather than changes it. So, I mean, hopefully, maybe with these kind of balance updates, we'll see them tweak and get, like, make our way more towards uh, support builds being more supported and 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 more viable and used in PvP. I think that would be really really cool to see. Um so that's that's really kind of about it for updates this week. We we got um we did get some release notes. We we did get a little bit of updates. It's mostly like I said, bounce updates, stuff like that. We did get some more stuff in the gem store. We got glittering weapons, which are really cool looking, I think. Uh, Thelros thinks they're dumb because they are glittery and butterfly-ish looking, but I really like them. So I got the staff for my Mesmer. Um, there's also an exalted glider, which is very shiny and gold. Um, so that's a thing. But yeah, they did they did some balance updates. They changed some Mesmer skills, some Necro skills, um, a lot of tweaking to Berserker stuff for the Warrior. I haven't really played my Warrior enough in Berserker yet to know much about what that really changed, if that was like a good thing or a bad thing or whatever, so yeah, I don't know. I just haven't, it's it's taking a long time to get all my characters to the elite specs because I did this dumb thing when we, when I was getting ready for the expansion, where basically, like, I had a character of every class, and I was like, you know, most of them were level 80. I was like, well, some of these characters don't really fit being the elite spec, but I want to play the elite spec, so I'll make a second character of that class to be the elite spec. So now I have these characters that haven't done much map completion or any map completion that have just been leveled up via tomes or something, so they don't have nearly enough hero points to actually get the elite spec. So it was kind of... that kind of backfired on me. It didn't work out as well as I had planned. But, oh well, I guess. So uh, one thing that did come out this week, not from ArenaNet, well, kind of. Basically, MMORPG.com released this interview with Colin Johansson um, about one week post Heart of Thorns launch. And it's 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 pretty interesting. I recommend reading it. Uh, not anything too shocking in there. Basically, one thing that they did touch on was that World v. World isn't like in the place that they want it to be quite yet. And so that's why a lot of it did not come out in Heart of Thorns as planned. A lot of the, the kind of changes and stuff that they wanted to do didn't didn't come to fruition. So that's that's too bad. But I recommend reading the whole post. It's really good. And it gives you a bit of insight about how they feel about how the expansion's going and stuff like that. Um, another thing was that over on the subreddit, uh, somebody started putting together a list of legendaries and whether they are cheaper to buy them or use the mastery system to craft them, which is really interesting and also makes me kind of want to cry a little bit. Um, some of them it's not quite known yet because people haven't made them or posted about it on the subreddit, but for example, Bolt to the Legendary Sword is apparently cheaper to craft than it is to buy from the trading post. Um, Kudzu, the legendary longbow, is also cheaper to craft than buy on the trading post. Twilight, the legendary greatsword that I am trying to make, is cheaper to purchase, and I already have most of it crafted, so yay, I'm wasting my gold. Um, yeah, 
So that's that's fun. Dreamer is also cheaper to purchase on the training post. Juggernaut, which is the um, legendary hammer, is cheaper to purchase on the training post. I think this is a really interesting thing. Um, I I didn't even consider. I always just assumed that they would always be cheaper to craft than it would be to buy on the trading post. And it makes me kind of sad that some of them are cheaper to just buy on the trading post than to craft. Especially since the one I'm working on is cheaper to buy than craft. But oh well. I know you're not super interested in making legendaries, the Theros, but do you think maybe this will make you ever buy a legendary if some of them are actually cheaper to purchase than to make anyway? The original reason I wanted to get a legendary was for the achievement on the character selection menu. That apparently isn't there anymore, so I guess it doesn't matter. I mean, there's still um, a, the a legendary th- achievement you can get in the achievement panel. Yeah, but it's not visible, so it, it doesn't really matter. Um, unless they come out with the legendary I actually find nice looking, probably not. Because, like, the vast majority of the legendary weapons are kind of too over the top for me. Mm. At least for the characters I like to have, so. Right. Alright, well, that's fair enough, I suppose. Yeah, I know you're. You've been struggling to find a great sword that's not flashy and also matches your color scheme. Yeah, kind of just using Ebon Blade right now. Hmm. Yeah, it works. It works. So yeah, that's uh, that's kind of it for news. Although later tonight, although I guess technically it'll be kind of tomorrow morning, Eastern time. Uh, right now, one of the uh, developers at Guild Wars 2, Les Bloom, is streaming for Extra Life, and he's raised actually over $1,000 now. We talked about this last podcast, um, and then because we talked about it, uh, he actually commented and invited us on to the stream, so later tonight we are actually going to be on his Extra Life stream to help him raise money for Extra Life for uh, children's hospitals in his area, so that's really cool. We're really excited about it. Um, Basically at 11.30 Pacific Standard Time, so that is 2.30 a.m. Sunday tonight, um, Eastern Standard Time. So this is only really going to affect people who are actually watching live right now, um, but of course we're going to tweet it. Um, and I'm sure there will be like a saved video on his Twitch channel afterwards. Basically, we are going to be going through with him and Dara, who is one of the QA people for Guild Halls, and we're going to be working on getting a guild hall for our guild, which is pretty exciting. So that should be fun. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're gonna help us go through a guild mission and then go do the expedition to claim the guild hall. It's gonna be fun times. So that's a thing. Um, if you're awake, definitely come watch. Or, you know, after this, go watch them. Um, cause he's, he's got all sorts of people on at various times doing various Guild Wars 2 things. And, uh, even if you miss the stream, definitely go donate, because I know, like, Extra Life, I'm pretty sure they take donations basically till the end of the year. I think that's how it works. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, it's a good cause, so go do that. Watch the stream if you can. Um, so yeah. And thanks to him again for inviting us to come onto his stream. It should be fun. But, uh, something else, uh, we finally finished the story this week for Heart of Thorns. Which is, you know, we don't want we don't want to spoil you guys, so we're going to give you a spoiler warning right now. If you have not finished Heart of Thorns, you should probably leave because we're going to have a discussion about the story now. Um, so, yeah, actually, I might do. Can I do a sticky message? Is that a thing I can do in Twitch? Maybe. Um, I don't know. I can't. I'm not. I can't be bothered right now. Whatever. Um, there's going to be spoilers. Sorry, everybody deal with it, um, so I'm just kind of stalling and giving people a little extra time to leave if they want. Um, I'll probably edit this out a bit, but yeah. Okay, so we finished this, the story for Heart of Thorns, so we're going to give a little bit of a recap about what happens, just to refresh you, or if you don't care about spoilers and so you kind of need this or whatever. So Heart of Thorns starts with you going from the Silver Wastes to Verdant Brink. And you have to decide if you're going to save the Pale Reavers or uh, help defend this little group of packed soldiers. Because there's Loranthier of the Wild, who's like the Pale Reaver leader. And he's like, oh, you know, these Mordrum came and took a whole bunch of people. But then there's this Char Vigil person, I think, or maybe she's Priory, I don't know. And she's like, no, Silvari are evil. Forget you guys. Let's just 
kind of, you know, defend what we have right now. Can't be bothered to go save people Mm -hmm. because they're evil. So you make that decision. um, And then after that, you go and you meet the Itzel, who are the, like, tree frog Hylek people. Um, And you kind of help them out a bit, fight against the Mordrim. Then after that, we're just kind of, I'm just kind of giving a really brief rundown of this. Then you go to, you, you kind of continue on trying to find Air and Logan and Zoja and Traherne, because as we know from the cutscenes, they kind of fell out of the sky. Um, so, it's, you know, where are they? Oh my gosh. Uh, after a bit of time, you finally find Air and Fowlin of the Nightmare Corps. Yeah, she, she's there. She's there. For some reason. We don't, we still don't really know why, um... As I was typing up this summary thing, I was like, wait, this was not actually ever explained why Fallon was there. She just kind of was. So Fallon and Air were just kind of in this Mordrum cage together. Because reasons. Um, and so that's kind of weird. And so we're trying to save Air and Fallon, and the Mordrum are attacking. Uh, Fallon dies. She gets kind of impaled on a thorn thing. Well, sort of dies. Sort of dies. I don't know exactly like, what happens after she gets impaled and pulled away. But. And she's kind of fighting that, and her and Air kind of, like, Air Fallon, like, tries to kill Air, basically, and so then Air gets killed by a Mordrum. Uh, so, Air dies. R.I.P. Air. Uh, Fallon is maybe kind of dead. Um, we know, we know Air is dead, because we, we still get her, her body and stuff, and Bram has to mourn and stuff. Bram shaves, shaves his, his head. head for some reason. <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. Um, we don't know where Garm is. I think at this point they're like, where's Garm? And then they never address Garm being Was missing. Was he in the cutscene? I don't remember. I'll have to go back and look. I feel like maybe he was. I think he was, yeah, but you never see him in the actual expansion area. Like, we right. have not even a slightest hint of him. Yeah. They even, like, um, like, mention it, I think, after he dies. Like, they just mentioned that they don't see him anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, as far as I know, and I've heard from, like, a couple of people around about that you hear something about him just in the general landscape, Mm -hmm. but that's unconfirmed, so I don't know exactly what happened to him so far. Garm is MIA, basically. So that's that's pretty sad. That's a very sad uh, whole chapter, and it's pretty early on in the story, too, so that was kind of weird. Um, after that, we meet the Exalted, who, as we know, are those big glowing dudes. Um, we meet the Exalted, because we're, we're still chasing Kaith and the Egg. And we finally... Turns out he was chasing the Egg, too. Yes, the Exalted guy that we run into is also chasing the Egg and Kaith. We finally catch up to Kaith with the Egg. And then Fowlin comes back as not really Fowlin. Fowlin's head on a giant, like, Mordrum beast body, which Vine is pretty freaky. Yeah, cold, yeah. Like it's basically this sort giant, like, plant dinosaur with a Fallon head. Sort of thing, yeah. So it's pretty freaky. Um, she starts chasing you. Kate, you know, gets turned around and drops the egg or whatever, so you pick up the egg. Um, picking up the egg gives you these, like, quote-unquote dragon powers, I think the little tracker thing calls them. And so you basically hmm. just get to jump higher and fly around a bit. Um, so you, you're running away from Fowlin and following this exalted guy. So finally you get away from Fowlin and the exalted's like, hey, you should bring this egg to Tarir because that's like our life goal, I guess, to have mm. this egg here. So you put the egg in Tarir and you get this vision that's pretty freaky and scary. And basically you see Zoja and Logan in these, like, pods, and they're, like, maybe unconscious or dead or in pain or something. And then you see Traherne, and then you see his, like, him split into, like, hundreds of Trahernes, and they're all, like, screaming and in pain, and it's not great. Then he has a very angry face. He has a very angry pain face. So, it's not great. So, from there, um... We're kind of we're kind of exploring around, trying to find Logan and Zodra and Traherne. And while doing so, we kind of come across these ruins in this map that indicate that maybe there are some Asuran ruins or an Asuran city nearby. And Timey figures that it is the lost uh, group of Asurans named Rada Novus, 
who decided not to leave underground as the Asuras who um, founded Rada Sum did. So we go to look for Rada Novus. And in Rada Novus' ruins, we find this new bug species called Chuck. Chuck. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the we, NBCs have an interesting pronunciation of Chuck. Yeah, they, they really enjoy the K. They really love emphasizing the K, and also sometimes it sounds like they're saying Chalk, like C H A L K. So that's kind of weird. Um, it's sort of like um, magic bugs. Magic bugs. So that's a thing, and uh, they basically feed off the leyline energy. And Ronovus was using leyline energy to power the city, so. The chalk kind of overran them, and they died, which is unfortunate. Um, but we find that there is a chamber in Radonovus that has some information on uh, Elder Dragon weaknesses. Especially, um, I think they had a particular grudge against Primordus, for obvious reasons, being right. Asura. But right. it's, uh, I think they have some on general dragons. Yeah, so uh, apparently the Radonovans figured out that every dragon has a weakness, but they didn't figure out what the weaknesses are, which is not helpful. But to find this out, we have to power up the city, and there's a broken ley line connector, and so Timey has to use Scruffy to make the connection again, which kills Scruffy. So current uh, death toll currently is Air, Fallon, and Scruffy, the golem. Possibly One also One of those Garm. is rather less than the others. Yes. Um... So from there, we're continuing on, trying to find Logan and Zoja. Uh, we come basically to the dragon lair kind of thing. Um, we find Logan and Zoja. You get the choice to either go for Zoja first or Logan first. Uh, whoever you pick the other person, then you have to fight Mordrum clones of them. So uh, when we did it, we fought a whole bunch of Logan Mordrum clones. Which apparently hurts a lot. Yeah, which hurts a lot. Um but they're both alive. Logan and Zoja are both alive. Uh, Zoja was more conscious than Logan, though, because I picked Zoja. From there, we then kind of climb this tower, and we finally get to kill Fallen Beast Thingy. That's uh, that's a thing. We finally With kill her. With the help her. of Kate. With the help of Kate. Kate does help. Funny grows a brain cell and decides that maybe her girlfriend isn't that. Well, to Spam. her credit, she was like, well, as soon as I saw that she was this beast, I knew it wasn't actually Fallon, so I knew I could just kill her or whatever. Even though there's not really that much difference between mm. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you kill Fallon, and as you kill Fallon, you see this, like, pod attached to a vine slither away, and Traherne is hanging out of it. So you have to go chase after Traherne. So you finally get down to the bottom, and... There's Traherne, half in this pod, and he's, like, half mordromized. He's, like, kind of gotten, like, there's, like, bits of that, like, barky armor on him. His eyes are, doesn't, don't have pupils anymore. And it's very sad, because I really like Traherne. And he's very sad looking, and it's like, well, we know Mordromoth has this one weakness. And, like, even though Traherne's kind of turning Mordrum eyes, he's still, like, lucid, and he's still himself. And he's like, well, I can, like, like I think Mordromoth's weakness is his mind. Like, he, he exists in the mind. Which makes sense, mm -hmm. because, you know, as Silvari, we know that the dream is a thing. Hmm. So we go into Mordromoth the dream thing. And we get to choose who to bring with us, basically. Like, Traherne is letting us letting us into the Mordrum off the dream because he's kind of got this connection because he's turning Mordrum. So you get to pick people. Because we're Silvari, we picked to take Kaith and Kanak because it didn't make sense to take non-Silvari in because it's such... I feel like if you're playing this as a non-Silvari, it's probably not anywhere near as emotional or satisfying of a thing because it's like, oh, the dream, who cares, whatever. But like as Silvari, it's like, this is everything, kind of, and it's like, you know. Yeah. Ritlock, I believe, decides to stay behind because he's done trying to go into metaphysical planes, more well, with him being Revenant and everything. I guess he's kind of got tired of it. Yeah. Uh, Marjorie stays behind to help defend your unconscious bodies. Right. And I believe, yeah, it's a choice between Kaith, uh, Kanak, and Bram. Yeah. And you pick two of them. Yeah, and you get to pick two of them. So we picked Kaith and Kanak. Fun thing is, if you do pick both Silvari, 
Ritlock has a line where he's like, oh, is it just me or is it weird that all the people going into the Dreamer Silvari, that's a little shady or whatever. So it does get acknowledged that you're all Silvari, which mm-hmm. is good. So then you go in and you fight uh, nightmare versions of people, basically. like you fight Blighted, I believe. Yeah, yeah Blighted. So we fought Blighted Kanak, we fought Blighted Pale Tree Mom um, for Kaith, and then, of course, we fight Mordremoth, who is a fat dinosaur. He's just a fat yeah. little dinosaur. Kind of underwhelming. Well, yeah, that music is damn good, though. Yeah, the music in the fight is really, really good. And then throughout the fight... Um, you fight blighted versions of your friends. Like, first, uh, blighted Ritlock comes in, you have to defeat him, and then he turns to your side, then you have to defeat blighted Marjorie. Yeah. Uh, the real kicker, which I did not expect, was eventually you have to fight the blighted version of your order mentor. So, Tharos was in charge of the instance, so we fought blighted Siren. If I had been in charge of the instance and we had to fight blighted Tybalt, I would have probably started actually crying and not actually been able to do the instance. Because that was just out of nowhere and just a big old punch to the gut. we were both playing through that because we we did most of these um, as a joke to make it easier because a lot of these content was pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when that happened, we were like, oh, well, um, what? I mean, I don't even like Siren, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is too much. And apparently if you... It is pretty cool, though. Yeah. um, After you actually turn them back by, I think it was um, making use of sort of rips in his mind. Yeah, you had to like open stuff. rifts in the mind, basically. Yeah, and they, they you know, they, they, I guess they sort of remember you, because I guess this is Modern Moth um, looking into your mind and using your memories against you. Yeah. So it's actually kind of heartwarming in a sense. Yeah, because yeah, cause after you beat them, then they turn and fight for you. And so that's the thing. Apparently if you do... <laughs> This, because you can you can start the Heart of Thorns story without actually completing your personal story. So if you've done that and you don't actually have an order selected or whatever, apparently you fight blighted Traherne. So that's kind of heartbreaky. Yeah, awkward. So then after you finally defeat Mordremoth, um, you you exit the dream or whatever, and you and the other Silvari or whatever, are like, oh my gosh, I'm still here and I'm still me because you know after killing Mordremoth, it's like, are we just gonna be dead? Are we just gonna be like, what's gonna happen? So you kill Mordremoth, and you're still there, and it's kind of like, yay! But then Traherne's like, I can still hear him, like, he planted a little Mordremoth seed in me, and so I, like, if you don't kill me, Mordremoth will continue on. Yeah, he'll regain his full power again. So you have to kill me. So on the other side of the chamber, you find Kaladbolg, his... Great sword made from the bark of the pale tree, and you have to kill... Sort of broken. Sort of broken from, you know, falling down or whatever through the packed fleet or whatever. So you go, you pick it up, and you have to kill Traherne with Khaled Bolg, and it's really sad. Yeah. And then there's a cutscene after that. Uh, you kill Traherne, there's a cutscene where all these cracks in the ground come out, um, all this energy is being released, I suppose... Um, some of these cracks of energy lead toward the egg in Tarir, and the egg kind of levitates up and starts sparkling and twirling and such. So that's where the Heart of Thorns story ends. I believe you see the egg start hatching. I think it, right at the end it starts doing Yeah, that. it's kind of hard to tell I'm if it's like right. hatching or just being glittery. Yeah, it's not something's happening with it. Something. And it just sort of stops. There. Yeah, so There's that's... There's no epilogue, you just sort of come out of the instance and you just you get the sword and you're done. Yeah, apparently you can go and talk to your friends again, like Marjorie and all them, but they don't apparently have much of anything epilogue-ish to say. Just like, yep, we did it. Okay. You no, know how much of a pain it is to get up there. <laughs> yeah. So that's... It kind of left us with a lot more questions than answers, to be honest. Such as, where is Garm? Um, did we really kill more Dramoth? Because there wasn't really, like, an ending. Like, when we killed Zaitan, it was like, we yeah, like, there's a big whole thing being like, yes, we killed the thing. Mordremoth is just kind of like, okay, we did it? Um, what? So we killed Mordremoth in the dream, but are there, does that mean that there are two dreams? Is there the dream that the Silvari have, and then, like, a separate Mordremoth dream? Or is it the same dream, and we just kill the Pale Tree? What's going to happen to the Pale Tree now? Uh, why did they talk about Nightmare Court all the time before the expansion released, and then, like, 
Nightmare Court just randomly shows up in the story. There's no explanation for why the Nightmare Court show up. If you do the Dragon Stand meta event, apparently one of the lanes is being run by a Nightmare Duchess or court, like a uh, Countess or whatever their hierarchy hmm. is. So like, why I is there just going to be the head now? Yeah, like why is there randomly Nightmare Court helping us now? Like, I mean, I guess I can understand why you know more draw see the evil friend, like enemy of my enemy is my friend or whatever. But like. Why are they here? What's happening? Um, what's the egg doing? Like, there's just so many more questions now than answers. Yeah, I think I think it's pretty pretty much certain that Modern Warfare is actually dead, mainly because they mention after you get out of the dream that they can't hear him anymore. Mm-hmm. The only person who could was Trahun for obvious reasons because it was actually inside. So, assuming he's telling the truth, I think he would probably know, considering he's had a dragon inside his mind right if like you kill him and it's done i think it is pretty likely that he is dead Mm -hmm. and that was just a release of energy like it's mentioned yeah plus it would be kind of anticlimactic to have to go through all that sacrifice everything and oh no no guess you guess you're not quite done yet i suppose i'm hoping in whatever living story stuff that they release in 2016 that we get some of these questions answered. Especially because, like, we never really knew a whole lot about Silvari and the dream and stuff before. And then when we found out that Mordremoth, like, basically created Silvari to be dragon minions, it was kind of... The kind of accepted idea was that, oh, well, Silvari who are closer to the dream won't be corrupted as easily. So, like, Nightmare Courtiers, Soundless Silvari, they're going to be uh, turned towards Mordremoth much quickly clear, whatever, than uh, Silvari, who are more attuned with the dream, because the idea was that the Pale Tree is shielding Silvari with Ventari's tablet and the dream. But now that doesn't seem like that's a thing, so I don't know what the deal well, it's is. That's the question, too, because if Mordemoth created Silvari, right. does well, that mean yeah. he also created the dream? Yeah, well, it seems like he created the, the framework for the dream, because he he has a dream. If it's the same dream as the Pale Tree's dream, still not 100% sure. Um, but also remember, they've been planning this shit for ages, because we learned in Season 2 that the dragon, the plant dragon that you fight as a Silvari in the tutorial instance, the first thing you do as a Silvari character is you fight a Mordremoth champion. You don't know it's a Mordremoth champion at the time. We only found that out a couple months ago, of course. But that's a thing. Um, so is is that because it's part of the dream that he's able to then like add put that in, or did he have to come? I don't know. I it's... mean, I, if I guess we assume that the reason that our playable Silvari aren't you know already automatically serving him is because of the tablet sort of interfering with what it was originally right. planned. But then... But then what about the other trees? Like, Malik uh, kind of just dropped off the radar, even though he, you would think that would be a pretty sizable plot point. Right, that's the thing. If you haven't done any Silvari personal stories, one of the possible personal storylines that you can get is uh, you come across this Silvari who has no memory of the dream or, like, what they're doing. So, like, you bring them into the Pale Tree, and it's like, oh, well, we'll, we'll look through the dream and we'll sort you out. We'll figure out, like, who you are. Um, and then the Menders, like, look through the dream or whatever, and they're like, um, yeah, you're not, like, in our directory, you're not, (laughs) like, you're not in this thing, and, uh, through a bit of investigation, you figure out that Malik is from a different pale tree, or, like, pale tree equivalent. In Mages Falls. In Mages Falls, which is where we are. So, the, I guess the idea is that he must have been a Silvari, you know, fruit thing. The pod fell and falls into the river. You find his pod in this personal story, like in um, Brisbane Wildlands. So I guess, you know, Mordremoth was churning out Mordrem, and then the one pod must have, like, fallen and not hatched there, so then he kind of gets mm-hmm. away from it and just is a Silvari yeah. then. So, Still raises the question of what happened to him, because I believe one of the last things he says before you finish that personal story, is he's going out back out west to where he came from and trying to raise an army to help fight the dragons. Right, and then... That's the last thing we hear. So the other thing about that is in the in his storyline, in the personal story, uh, the Nightmare Court are trying to get a hold of him because they think he's the quote-unquote 
harbinger. They don't say what he's the harbinger of or whatever. But then in the gem store recently, there was the harbinger of Mordremoth outfit, which was, you know, all Mordremothy. And so people were making the connection like, oh, harbinger, Malik is supposed to be the harbinger. There's this harbinger of Mordremoth outfit. What if, yeah, what if that's a thing? What if the Nightmare Court predicted this would happen or something? Maybe that's why the Nightmare Court is out there. Maybe they're trying to find Malik still. And so then the, the Mordremoth stuff happened. I don't know. But yeah, I wish they would have covered the Malik stuff. I'm really hoping they cover that in continuing living story stuff. Although we found, like, we've killed Mordremoth now, supposedly. So why would they? It seems weird to not talk about that in the Heart of Thorn story. I wish they talked about what the heck the Nightmare Court's doing there and how that kind of dynamic is because, you know, the Nightmare Court's thing is that they are against the Pale Tree imposing Ventari's tablet um, ideas onto Silvari, which, I mean... So they impose their ideas on people instead. Right, like, at, at the very surface level, the Nightmare Court stuff makes sense because it's like, yeah, I can see why you wouldn't want some other race's ideals and morals being imposed on your race. That makes sense. But then to be like, well, it's clearly the answer is to torture everyone. That's not. It's literally what they do. <laughs> right. So, that's, yeah. So, yeah, they set up this whole thing, it was going to be really interesting, like, oh, like, will the Nightmare Court go with Morgemoth, or, like, will they have to kind of accept that they haven't done things the right way inside with the Pale Tree, and it could have been this really interesting thing, but then nothing happened, and there was nothing about the Nightmare Court except that Fallon and those random other people were just kind of randomly there for no reason. So, I really hope they answer that. I really hope we get more answers about what the heck is the deal with the dream. What the heck, why did Silvari get wild hunts? Like, because that's the other thing. It's like, Kate's wild hunt, which is like a Silvari thing that you get sometimes. It's like, oh, your life goal is to do this. So, like, Traherne's wild hunt was to cleanse Orr. Um, which he did. Which so. he did. So, yeah. GG Traherne. You did it. Um uh, but, like, Kate's wild hunt was apparently to get and take care of the egg. But then the egg was like, nah, I'm gonna go with this other person who is the commander. Um, whether you're Silvari or not. So that's kind of a thing. So, like, where Which is supposed to be the explanation of why Kate sold went, went nuts and the cliff and stole yeah. the egg and didn't tell anybody anything. <sighs> but yeah, I just. I want more answers about Silvari stuff. I want more answers about Nightmare Court stuff. I want Jahern to not be dead. I think we both One spent... One of those might happen, but I would <laughs> We spent, the, like, the couple hours after finishing the story just being like, well, that's... that happened. And I just I couldn't... Mean, I just couldn't play Guild Wars 2 the rest of the day, because it's just like, I don't... I can't. I spent a lot of time before this expansion, and I was pretty much calling that he is either going to be evil or die. I was pretty much right. Are you happy now? Not really. Being right is usually good. But not in this case. I mean, I didn't want to be right. I just expected it. I suppose. <laughs> in this case. So, I guess we should maybe do a, like, a summarized, uh, maybe comparison of this compared to the lead up with Zaitan, considering we've now killed two Elder Dragons. We've now killed two Elder Dragons, which is a feat. How do you think this whole sort of story setup is in comparison to the other one? Well, it, I've been trying to think about this a lot the past couple of days since we finished it. Like, my perception, it feels like it took a lot longer to kill Zaitan than it did to kill Mordremoth, but... Yeah, because it was about, I think... Do you start the main Zaitan stuff around level 50? Unless you're Silvari, in which case you start it way earlier. I suppose, but it's not, like, dedicated. You are right. working against Zaitan. You start the real Zaitan. Oh, I guess, no, I guess... You really start the Zaitan stuff at level 30 when you pick your order, because I think... I haven't done a Sura or human ones, but I think all the other ones, you have to defend some order from Risen minions, basically. Mm, I think it depends what race you pick. I think it all... Uh, you know, what one you pick, because I know some of them are different dragons. Like, I think one has Primordus focus. Oh, right, okay. That's I a think. good point. I don't remember exactly, but... Like I said, I haven't done all of the races, so... I think Claw Island is generally what yeah. it starts like... Claw Island is definitely the for sure first place where you... So it's, yeah, a good 40 levels worth of build-up. Right. Um, and I mean, I guess technically... I But when that's the thing. It's like my perception is that it's like, oh, we just, like, boom, 
Mordremoth dead done. But I guess the reality is, though, is that they've been building up to Mordremoth since the release of the game in very subtle ways. Like with the Silvari, the first thing you fight is a Mordremoth minion. Um, you know, all of season two of the living story is leading up to fighting Mordremoth. And then, obviously, the entire Heart of Thorns story itself is leading up to fighting Morjamoth, and then you do it. So I guess, in reality, there is a lot more time spent leading up to fighting Morjamoth than Zaitan. But I feel like there's just something... The Zaitan fight itself, totally unrewarding, not emotionally charged at all. It's mm. an uninteresting fight, I think. It's cool. Um. It's really cool looking, like, Zaitan uh, itself looks cool, but the fight is, like, you just sit behind a laser and you fire things. I think, yeah, mechanically it's not very interesting. I think I, it was rather emotional for me, at least the, like, the, the setup, uh, the music and stuff was good. As I see, you know, you're just shooting a cannon and it's boring. I see. But being up in the sky on the ship with all of the Destiny's Edge and stuff around you finally gets it, that's fine. That's actually good. I, I don't think I mean, it was not imp- bad, but it wasn't as good as the Heart of Thorns final fight. Yeah, I think, like, I've, in a way, they kind of have similar flaws. I think Saitan to me probably yeah, was the mechanics. It's, it's almost just, like they you have... You don't have... The actual fighting is impersonal. Right. I think it's almost the opposite. Like, Zaitan looked really cool, but the fight wasn't that engaging or anything. Um, whereas Morjamoth, really stupid looking, to be honest... But the fight itself is really intense. Yeah, I think, like we mentioned, it's maybe because we're both, we were both playing Silvari and we both picked Silvari. Mm-hmm. Uh, it felt way more personal, a right. fight. Because it's like, yeah, this is the person that creates, we're going to kind of kill them out and stuff. Right. That's kind of way... And like, dealing with, I could be corrupted at any second kind of thing. Yeah, that, I guess we should mention that. Yeah, they kind of, Arena kind of... Um, Maybe hype that a bit too much. Right. The really, the only way it sort of appears is maybe two or three times in the, maybe like a half a dozen times in the story. Like occasionally he'll just get a bit dizzy sometimes and you'll hear his voice. Mm-hmm. And which is actually something I find really cool is that Kanak will, since he is also a Silvari, and the only one you're actually traveling with, um, will you usually come in because he's experiencing the same thing you are. You get some really good conversations with Kanak if you are a Silvari. Like, where you're both kind of trying to keep each other in check, like, are you feeling okay, Commander? Are you feeling okay, Kanek? Yeah, I actually really like how, like, you normally if, like, someone on your team might post me, you usually say to them, are you alright? I actually really, really like how he's like, every time you say that, he's like, are you? Right. Like, it, it it's just going to put you on the same level sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, As I say, it doesn't really come to anything. Like I think at one point in like near the end of the fight with Modern Moth, you sort of get a bit dizzy. The sort of targeting shows him as an ally, and then your right, your yeah, allies that is enemies, that is of. really cool. Like it's not just oh, like you get dizzy and some dialogue happens. Like your friends become targetable enemies. Like you can attack them. Whereas Modern Moth becomes like green name and like green health bar. You can't. He's an ally. So that's an interesting touch. Um, yeah, but like you said, it, it is very visually boring. But yeah, it just felt more emotionally climactic. I think the main difference is with Zaitan, it wasn't personal for you aside from maybe avenging your mentor, I suppose. Yeah. But aside from that, it's like, it's just you're doing it because it's the thing to do. It's the generic kind it's of more... for Tyria. It's like... Yeah, there's... which is good. Which is good. Not... It's not. It's it's pissed. epic on a grand scale kind of thing, but it's not epic in a it ties in my personal story kind of thing. It's just like, well, this is this the thing I'm supposed to do. Whereas with Morjamoth, if you play Silvari, it's like this is so yeah. personal. And again, like, I think a lot of people have mentioned when they do that, you kind of I wouldn't necessarily take a back seat, but you sort of just with Destiny's Edge. It's Destiny's Edge and this other guy, right, or girl. With this, it's you are taking a really prominent position, right. And, okay, so we haven't touched on it yet, but I guess now is as good a time of any. The last boss fight against Mordremoth is buggy as hell. It's so buggy. It is buggy. So buggy. We had to try it, what, five or six times before we were able to finally finish it? Not because, well... Some of that because of bad design rather than bugginess, but yeah. Right. But a lot of it was because bugginess. Like, there would be bits where I'd have to suicide myself over and over again so that we could restart the instance. Okay, yeah. So, let's see. The first time, like, the first bug was because we died, 
reset it, and one of the I can't remember what they call it, like reality time rifts. Rifts, rifts yeah, that sort of stuff appeared on a place that part like, of the ground was like, missing. Breaks part of the, the yeah the ground where you fight. Except he put the rift there, so you can't actually go to it. Yeah, that was the first bug. Uh, the other bug was well, just the sort of, the, the mushrooms music stops. Oh yeah, the music just randomly <laughs> stops. Was... All audio cuts out. Um, there was a part where the you have to like jump up into the air with these mushrooms and then glide around to avoid getting hit. And Thoros, you like the mushroom bugged out and wouldn't jump you up, and so you yeah. just died. Yeah, there was no way to actually get up in the air. To be honest, that section of the fight doesn't really explain that work. It's like the account dimensions get up in the air or shield yourself. So I think it's Kanak sort of sets up a shield thing. And I presume the first time that you go over then that makes you okay because mm. it's a shield. Apparently you have to make your own shield right. of some kind. I don't know exactly what, how you do that. but Yeah, some yeah. classes can do that. But yeah, That doesn't work. So I died the first time doing that. Mm-hmm. The next time yeah, it's, it's awkward. Uh, the other thing, which isn't really so much a bug as it is a really bad design decision, is every time you die in that fight with Mordenroth himself, I don't know how it works in the other ones because we didn't really fail that much. Right. Um, you get placed in a sort of cage overlooking the fight and you can't do anything. Unless your whole watch, team dies. And, yeah, until either your team wipes or you win. So Which after a couple of the times of stupidest yeah. design choice for an epic story heavy fight I can possibly think of. Because this actually had to happen because I died towards the end again. Because mm-hmm. most of my arm was broken. So the very epic last like pitch battle, which uh, you didn't seem to enjoy that much because it was very annoying. But I ended up having I'm to solo the last half in the of cage, it. Talking like I'm fighting while Scissor is going running around doing the actual fight. Which is ridiculous. I get to do the last blow, sure, mm-hmm. well, but it's still what very a kill boring steal. And stupid. Yeah, I guess it's a kill. <laughs> but... So yeah, that kind of really sucked. Um, I feel like yeah, combined with all those bugs, it's just terrible. I think I also should mention that we were both playing mesmers, so we're both very squishy. But yeah, um, the actual mechanics of the fights weren't too bad, though. Yeah, like opening, going and opening the rift, and like having to uh, defeat the blighted versions is fine. Because yeah, the Kanak fight, I believe, he just threw a lot of grenades around. Um, um, the pale tree with some of these orbs that just sort of float around, and they hit you, do a little bit of damage. She occasionally will summon blighted other Silvari that sort of go towards her, and she gets stacks enough to like blow you up. Yeah, it was... Those were fine. Yeah, like, it took... I think we died, like, once or something during the Pale Tree fight before we figured out what the mechanics were, and then it was like, oh, okay, we get it, and that's that's fine. You, I mean, you gotta be on your toes during the fight, and so it's a bit challenging, but it's not like, oh, whatever. But yeah, the bugs really... What kind of made the last fight more difficult than it should be. Yeah. I'm not sure whether I'd say which one is better, like, as a fight, because, like we said, it was really impactful... The, just not only because it's like a bunch of Silvari, but I think Kanak in general, you get a lot more, I guess, focus on him because mm-hmm. he's a Silvari and the only Silvari you actually talk to that much. Right. Because when you so talk you to Kaith, lot... it's just kind of like, I don't trust you at all. I hate you. It's basically your reason. interaction with Kaith. Yeah. Yeah. Kanak, you get a lot of character them on him through the story. I actually kind of want to mention him a bit because he's probably my favorite character of this expansion in particular because you don't really see a lot much of the others. Yeah. But, and the, you know, some of them are dead now, so I'm kind of running out. And and in the fight itself, he gets a lot of character development, because... Oh, yeah, yeah. Because with the fight with um, Blighted Kanek, which is kind of, I guess you could say, a temptation or sort of thing for him, mm. he has to sort of resist it, and you end up fighting Blighted Kanek with him. It's yeah. actually yeah, really, really uh, good. And he's probably... I'm trying to think now. Who, who's actually left alive? Uh, Kanek, Kate player character. Are we talking Silvari or... Just in general. Uh, Marjorie Kazmir. Zodia, Marjorie Kazmir. Um, Logan. Logan Ritlock. Zoja. Yeah. Most of those I don't like. Ritlock's fine. Oh, Rock let's talk fine. about Ritlock really quick. Um, I didn't think about this because I was so focused on the, oh my god, Silvari, oh my god, your hern's dead, I'm gonna cry forever thing. But then I was reading some Tumblr posts and some Reddit threads and somebody brought up a really good point, like kind of a whole part of the setup for Heart of Thorns was like, oh, we're going to find out where Ritlock's been, like what Ritlock did in the mists, and 
how is he a revenant now? Like, what is that about? But, like, you know, he comes in from in from the mists to save our asses in the last second in the first chapter of the Heart of Thorns story, and everybody's like, whoa, Ritlock, what's that magic you're using? Where have you been? What's going on? He's like, never mind that right now. We've got stuff to do. And, and he literally, says that about a dozen times. Yeah, like, anytime anybody is trying to be like, so, Ritlock, you ready to tell us fucking anything about this thing that you're doing? And he's like, no. Like, we don't get any information at all about what he's been doing in the rift. Or in the mist. The rift? What? The mist. And, like, how he's a revenant now, and, like, how he talks to legends or anything. We don't get any revenant lore that we were kind of led to believe we might be getting. So that's another kind of question that I would like to see answered soon, please. Like, what is that even? <laughs> yeah, like, it makes sense. Because it more important things were going on at the time, and it is Ritlock. He never really had much patience for sort of chatting around. Right. But hopefully, I'm hoping we do hear something about that. I'm thinking maybe he'll, he'll be open up. Maybe one of the focuses of the next bit of story content whenever that comes out. I'm thinking like he'll sort of tell us his story of what happened. Because if Glint's egg is hatching and he is clearly like a herald spec revenant because he can use Glint uh, legend stuff. So he's yeah. he's been able to tap into Glint's le- legacy or whatever. So Glint's egg is waking up, so I'm sure there'll be there's gotta be some interaction there. But yeah, I'm uh, expecting him to tell us what happened to him while he was in. The, I uh, hope in so. Some way. But um, back so, to the fight. I definitely, without a doubt, would say I liked this Mordremoth fight way better than the Zaitan fight. Yeah, I think the I think the major major pro for the Zaitan one is just it looked really cool. Yeah, Zaitan is scary looking. Giant he is snake mouth, terrifying thing. Thing. I guess yeah. Mordremoth's terrifyingness is like a different kind of terrifying like Zaitan is very physically terrifying because like death is a very physical thing whereas Mordremoth is more about uh like mind mental terror pain. yeah like Sorry, mental yeah. parody which makes sense i guess yeah because he's using but... you know your own memories and stuff against you using yourself against you kind of thing so i guess yeah Honestly, i think it might have been cooler if that final boss fight with Mordremoth took the form of Trahern <sighs> I wouldn't have been able to do it. I, have I been think able that to. actually would have been more impactful, and it would have been more fitting. I think with like his whole mental control sort of thing. Yeah, and maybe use that other like that or uh, occasionally throughout the story you see Morjamoth is this like when you're a Silvari like you see Morjamoth is this like weird like black shadow dragon face thing with like glowing eyes. I think if we had fought that too instead of the <laughs> fat dinosaur would have mm-hmm. been better. I mean, even, like, possibly fighting yourself. Right, yeah, like, the the the, the doppelganger thing, like, a blighted version of yourself would have been... Although, yeah, I guess... Look really cool. I oh, no, I feel like that could have worked, even if you're not Silvari, because he's still using, like, yeah, your own you, mind against you. I think, I believe it's mentioned that if you pick Bram, you have to fight blighted air, air. and gum. Right. So, yep. yeah, that would have... I think either of those, like, maybe Trahern or yourself would have been more emotionally impactful than a giant fat crocodile man. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I think overall it is better. Um, Kanak is probably one of my new favorite characters because you get so much character development with him. Again, probably because I did pick a Silvari. Mm. So you get a lot of more personal moments with him where you're sort of confiding in you know, the fact that you could both turn evil at any time. At any second. Yeah. So that's... I- that's... Yeah. I like that your character themselves seems to have actually some progression... I don't know if the non Silvari are as sort of coldly serious as the mm. other ones. Like, yeah, yeah especially for you because you're, you know, you've played the female Silvari who's normally pretty bubbly, whimsical. Whimsical is the word, yeah. Bubbly and all that stuff. Whereas in Heart of Thorns, it's very like no nonsense. I believe at one point it's like someone asks, um, "What should we do with Kate if she's like evil or something?" And you're just like, "Kill her." I just think it was like, "Burn the bot." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or like, if, if so, if we die, like, what happens? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's just something super burnt, like, super cold, just burn Just like, them. yeah, burn the body. Yeah, it's it's super cold. It was cold. I actually really like how just straight cold it was. And it makes sense for Silvari. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think just the fact of how personal it was as a Silvari probably puts it as a better than the Zaitan, even with how many falls of, like, there's so many plot threads that just don't get answered. Mm-hmm. I think it did feel a little rushed. Maybe yeah. they should have held off actually beating Zaitan until... Not Zaitan. <laughs> until after the expansion. Mm. 
Yeah, because now it kind of feels silly, like, going through the zones, because we haven't finished completing the zones yet, but we've done the story now, and so it's kind of like, well, what's the point? I mean, we already killed him. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think it just, yeah. Again, as a Silvari, you, you sh- I would recommend doing that. The, this expression first on the Silvari, if at all possible. Yes. It's like ten times as impactful as it otherwise might be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, R.I.P. Air, and I don't want, I don't know if I want to say R.I.P. Fallon. No. Rest in pieces. <laughs> R.I.P. Air and Scruffy and Traherne. Scruffy actually is in pieces. <laughs> yeah, he is literally in pieces. Literally in pieces. Oh, yeah, and then to rub salt in the wounds of, oh, you just killed Traherne with his own sword made out of his mom's body, basically, which is a really weird thing to think about. You then get, as a reward, you get broken Kaladbolg as a one-handed sword skin, and it doesn't glow anymore because Traherne's dead. Yeah. If anybody tries to come into the comments of this episode and tell me that they're glad Traherne is dead, fight me IRL. <laughs> I love Traherne, and I'm not going to sit here and take your Traherne hate anymore. Fight me. Uh, so, yeah, overall, it's. I'm not going to put a score to it because I can't really do that, but. No, I, I think don't it, like it, it's things. good. At least in terms of the. It's well written in terms of emotional impact. Yeah. For a Stilvari, at least. Rush too much, and there's a lot of questions that don't get answered. Yeah, I will say that I am very much looking forward to the next living story or whatever way they decide to further the story. Mm-hmm. I think, I know a lot of people criticize Arena Nett's character writing, and I do think some characters fall flat, but I think this expansion, like, the character development Kanak's, was Kanak in general, so good. Like, especially him. Yeah. It was so good. Very, very good. Yeah, it's actually interesting. I think you could go on tangents, but you notice that none, not really the other characters get much attention at all. Like, even Ritlock doesn't pop in that much, even though he's a freaking revenue came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. You ask him a few times about his stuff, and he just doesn't respond. And then Marjorie and Kazmier barely get any attention, which I'm not sad about at all. Right, well, because at the very start of the thing, Marjorie's like, oh, I don't trust Silvari. Nah. And that didn't Silvari. Really go anywhere, did it? Yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, it felt like they were kind of setting up the expansion to be like, oh, every time you make a decision in the personal story, there's, like, repercussions later on. But I feel like there weren't, unless we, like, I don't know. We've only obviously done the one playthrough. I might try making other decisions in my other playthroughs to see if they do change. Maybe it. as a non Solari. Yeah. How, see how that goes. That makes. <laughs> do I have any? Yeah. Name? I I <laughs> I have two level eighties who aren't Solari. I had to think about that really hard. <laughs> like, uh, Timey is pretty much the same annoying Sarah. Uh, um, I mean, she does have a bit of development because she she sacrifices. She gives up Scruffy. Scruffy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Scruffy gets a moment because he has to like connect these two sort of cable things to, you know, get mm-hmm. this power so you can progress. He actually pauses before he does it, like he's scared. Right. Which is kinda weird. Yeah, I would probably find it endearing if I actually liked a sir in any way. But I you don't so. play a s an sir. I do. I don't like them though. <laughs> Alright, fair enough I guess. So yeah, I feel like did any of the characters really get much of anything? Um, I mean, it felt like mostly Kanak. I feel like the attention was mostly on Kanak. Uh, Br- uh, Bram did get some attention because Air died. Yeah, Bram, of course, with his vengeance story. Right. And Kate, I guess, a bit too. Right, because we those were chasing three, her. Which, uh, no surprise, is why those three are the ones right, she gets Right, yeah, back. it makes sense. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think, yeah, Kanak alone is probably like some of the best character development they've done mm. in recent time I can think of. Better than anything in season two. Right. Thank God, because Case he puts so much attention on her in season two. I just find her to be really stupid that it just jars me. Well, I mean, the source of a lot of her problems is now gone. So yeah. I'm yeah. hoping that we see some interesting Case development in the and future. In terms of her brain power, yes. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Do you have anything else to add? I think I've said my. I've I've kind of just 
sparked up all my questions that I have about the person's um, story. Probably the only other thing. I'll be looking forward to seeing how Zodio reacts to Air being dead. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's... A, that's. Oh, the other thing is, like, when you first get to Zodio... about her when she wakes up. The first thing Zodio asks when you go to get her out of the pot, she's like, Air? And you're like, uh... Mm, are you okay? <laughs> I believe they haven't told... They never actually mentioned it yet. No, we yeah, they... We, we didn't so, tell her. And, yeah, that's gonna be awkward. Because I don't think they ever truly sort of... They never made up, I don't think. 100%, anyway. Like, I mean, they were okay enough to be on the packed fleet together, but if, like, they weren't super, they weren't besties. No. Also, where the fuck is Garm? Those two. Seriously, where is Garm? Where? I want to know that the dog is okay. That, that's my two things. Yeah. Also, can I have a Traherne mini? I'm surprised there isn't one already. I mean, I know they get like, the blighted Traherne. Oh, uh, ew. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I got this idea of, like, a blighted sort of Traherne mm-hmm. mini of, like, him, like, half in the, like, vine pod and, like, it just kind of flops around after you and it's like, ugh. Yeah. Yeah. R.I.P. Traherne. Fight me IRL if you hate Traherne. I love Traherne. Uh, that's it. <laughs> and that's it. That's, uh, that's our show. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks for listening and watching and listening to us ramble on about plant people. Um, Next week, we'll have a regular show, and then after that, we're going to be on a bit of a break for three weeks, because I'm going on vacation, and I, I do all the editing stuff, so sorry. Um, but yeah, so next week, episode 10, and then we'll be on a hiatus. Uh, don't forget to donate to Les Bloom's um, Extra Life campaign. That's, of course, going to be in the show notes, and we'll see you next week. If you want more Radio Freeteria, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and over at RadioFreeteria.net, you'll find our RSS feed. Don't miss out on our live streams. Every Saturday at 6 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, we record Radio Freeteria live at twitch.tv slash Radio Freeteria. We also stream Guild Wars 2 gameplay on and off throughout the week. If you want more news from us, you can find Radio Freeteria on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and Tumblr. And of course, for more information about us and our show, you can always check out RadioFreeteria.net.